Hello again, everyone. This is Father Rob, and with this recording, we'll begin reflecting on Albacete's cry of the heart. So permit me to make an adjustment to the original plan, which was first to read the sections in their entirety, and then to reflect on them. But since a good number of you have purchased the book and are already reading along, I think maybe it's best to just jump right into the highlighting of some of Monsignor's main points with the hopes of helping you to understand them a little better. So this first reflection will be based on the first three sections of chapter one, A Mystery to be Lived, pages one through eight. Let's begin. Let's note well first that Monsignor chooses to begin his reflections on the meaning of suffering by recalling the words of the French 20th century Catholic Francois Mauriac, who saw the concentration camps as a failed dream. Now, not the failed dream of Hitler, but the failed dream of the Enlightenment. On page two, Albacete quotes Mauriac, the dream which Western man conceived in the 18th century with the beginning of the French Revolution vanished before those trainloads of little children. So this is Monsignor's starting point, that this idea of being able to live the fruits of Christianity without being rooted in a relationship with the church that gave birth to these Enlightenment ideals, that you can just eliminate suffering by wishing it away, is a failed dream. So when modern man, for example, promises himself that he can eliminate suffering, he creates more suffering. While he's obligated to alleviate suffering, out of compassion, he only harms himself when he tries to eliminate it altogether. And there's a difference, as we'll see, a difference between eliminating and alleviating suffering. So, the Holocaust is the face of this false promise that man makes to himself. The Holocaust is what happens when man tries to eliminate suffering. We'll talk more about that later. The fall of man itself, right, the fall in the book of Genesis, is based on a false promise that Satan makes to man that he can spare himself the experience of suffering. It's just not true, because life is suffering. It's, it's angst. It's that question of why. The man who tries to save himself from suffering tries to gain the whole world at the expense of his soul. So I think that what Monsignor means on page three, for example, when he says that anger, anger cannot be and cannot be allowed to be the last word about human life, is the cry of his own heart that we would resist the temptation to eliminate suffering through violence. So, even if our intentions were to create a kind of utopia, we would only be creating a kind of hell for ourselves, the hell of regret known by the man who tries to save his own life. In some sense, we were made to wrestle with the reality of life in this world, which is suffering. All right, then Monsignor gives us the permission to direct the anger we feel about suffering towards God. And that's interesting. It seems like, you know, irreverent for a priest to do, but... The last line on page three gives voice to this pain. In the face of the sufferings of the children of Africa, the atheist Germain Greer, with whom Monsignor had dealings, proclaimed, If God exists, I hate him. This is where Albacete jumps into the deep end of his thoughts on suffering. He sees this kind of wrestling with suffering as a striving towards transcendence, as he calls it. So, even as a sign of personal authenticity and sanctity, Again, scandalous, thinking about an atheist saying, if God exists, I hate him. But the fact that this person is wrestling with suffering shows that there's a striving toward transcendence. Again, the wrestling with it, not the elimination of it, not the denial of it. And then, being Christian, a Catholic priest, and a friend of Pope John Paul II, he moves into an appreciation for the solidarity. That's very much a John Paul II word the solidarity that suffering creates among those who suffer. I use the word creates or emphasize the word creates because he calls this kind of suffering with the other or co-suffering as creative suffering. We read that on page four. Creative. I think what he means by creative suffering is that suffering can create solidarity between those who suffer with one another. He is careful, however, not to imply that we share the pain of another person. Like that person's experience is uniquely his or her own. He seems to be with C.S. Lewis on that. When he wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain, that there's no such thing as the sum of suffering, for no one suffers it. He was teaching us that it's not just mere sentimental piety to say that God would have sent his son to die for only one person if only one person needed to be saved. 
He's teaching us that God doesn't come to die for humanity per se, but you know, but for you and for me. And while Christ's death on the cross somehow does reconcile all of humanity to God, the experience of suffering nonetheless is only ever experienced by the person, that there's no such thing as the sum of suffering. For as long as one person is suffering, it pierces the heart of God. He says we, we share the questioning that the person experiences. Monsignor is saying we share the questioning, and thus we suffer with the one who suffers. We co-suffer with that person. I mentioned in my introduction to you that I read Monsignor's God at the Ritz while in the seminary. Looking back at the volume I was reading in the Ski Lodge, I find that the 19th chapter has the most underlinings and notes in the margins, and the name of that chapter is Co-Suffering. And much of what is written in these introductory sections of Cry of the Heart is taken directly from that chapter. So, if you'll pardon the pun, this idea of co-suffering is at the heart of Cry of the Heart. His heart, Monsignor's heart, is consecrated to God. So he sees suffering has something to do with our search for the mystery. So he believes that suffering reveals something of the transcendence of the human person, you are know, being made for God. And he says, it points to a mystery that is the author of the drama of human life. That instead of proving there is no God, the suffering of human beings is a sign of God. All right. Now, with regard to the title of this section, Accusation and Acknowledgement, Lorenzo is saying that the fact that we refer to pain as suffering is an accusation directed against whatever mystery is permitting this experience, but in doing so cannot help but be an acknowledgement of the transcendent. Suffering makes God's existence evident by throwing into question God's goodness. This, in a sense, is the suffering we're talking about. I think it's important also to distinguish between human suffering and animal suffering. While animals endure the sensations of physical pain, it is human suffering that questions and cries out. Therefore, it's human suffering that becomes a sign of transcendence. So that's the questioning and crying out, the asking of why. Cardinal O'Malley says something like that in his foreword, by pointing out that spiritual pain is also pain, that spiritual pain is experienced only by the human person. All right, so this is about human suffering. In the section entitled Co-Suffering and the Unutterable Question, this means we are willing to serve on the jury in the trial of God and to risk our own faith by identifying with those who suffer in their questioning of God. And this can be very off-putting to a pious person, this idea of questioning God, but it's crucial Because if we refuse to stand in the nature of the person's sufferings, which is ultimately the question, why, then we are reduced to offering what Monsignor calls the cruelest response to suffering, which is the attempt to explain it away. Now, why cruel? Aren't we just trying to help? Why is it cruel and not just unhelpful or disagreeable? Why cruel? That word points back to the concentration camps. The Nazis hated the Jews because they blamed the Jews for the world's suffering. But since they couldn't explain the Jews away, they tried other means of eliminating them, all of which were cruel. Perhaps Monsignor is teaching us that there is something similar happening when we attempt to explain away the suffering of another person. He sees it as explaining away the person a kind of spiritual extermination of the person in order to eliminate the suffering. This is what I think he means when he says on the bottom of page 6 and the top of page 7, this does not do justice to the one who suffers. I call this the secularization of suffering, the elimination of its link with transcendence. It makes sense, then, that Monsignor Albacetti would offer a word about Job. The story of Job is the oldest story in the scriptures because it's about the cry of the human heart. And even the book of Genesis was revealed by God to man in response to his Job-like cry, the cry of, why? What did I do to deserve this? You know, where does the suffering come from? In any case, it is enough for us to know that Monsignor rightly understands how Job's friends 
let him down by trying to explain away the meaning of his suffering. Instead, something remarkable happens, and it's the only thing that can comfort the otherwise inconsolable Job. God co-suffers with him. I can hear Monsignor going, splendid. <laughs> I love what he said. If you watch videos of Monsignor Abbasetti, you're gonna, you will hear him at one point say splendid. I think, it, I think it's splendid in any case. God asks Job, Monsignor writes, to consider his origins, to realize that he was created without any claim to existence, that he is not his own maker. His existence is sheer grace. And this is the key to this book. Job discovers himself when he is asked by God to consider the mystery of his human identity. And what is the mystery of his human identity? That he was made to be with God. And what opened that up for him? It was his suffering. This is what Monsignor means when he writes, suffering is an expression of human personhood, human transcendence. You know, the sacredness of the human person. Remember, Monsignor Albacetti is a friend of John Paul II. And the last line of this section is, I think, the greatest of all that have come before. The communion of life born through shared suffering is the strongest interpersonal communion in the world, breaking down all barriers among human beings and bringing us together through a bond with transcendence with something always greater than us. That last line of these first three sections of this first chapter, I think, are at the heart of what he's saying to us. I'll read it again. The communion of life, the communion of life, God is life, born through shared suffering, is the strongest interpersonal communion in the world. Shared suffering, he's saying, creates the strongest bonds between peoples, breaking down all barriers among human beings. You ever been in a trying circumstance, like on a, on a train or something in the subway? I mean, how quickly we all become friends? Or like 9-11, there were no enemies in the streets on 9-11. They died in the cockpit of the planes. And bringing us together through the bond with transcendence, a bond with tra- bonding us with God. What a great communion to share with people in this world, to be bonded together with the mystery that has formed us with something always greater than us. So just lastly, I want to share, we used to take students to Peru on mission trip when I was in the high school. And if we did experience something of God's life, if we did touch something of the transcendent there together, it was because of the way we co-suffered with one another at times. Now, the work itself was demanding and required sacrifice, but that's not the kind of suffering I'm talking about here. After reading this, I realized the suffering that goes beyond that something that breaks in that causes you to cry, cry why, Um, these are the ones that I think touch something of the transcendent. So one year, for example, I had to tell a girl that her mother died back here in New York. And when I got her father on the phone and asked what I could do to help her, he said, just hold her. I mean, on another trip to Peru, we received the news that our beloved athletic trainer and his son died in a car accident. And again, back here in New York, I told the kids and let them cry. And then I went off to a quiet corner to be alone. And uh, a student found me, a big kid who was on the football team. Uh, he didn't say anything. He just And I apologized. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and he just smiled kindly. We never talked about that moment. But uh, to this day, I do still speak with that boy and his family. So again, these bonds that form when something breaks and that cause you to causes you to cry. No answers being given, no easy explanations, just presence. And, and also being willing to say, I don't know why, and then to question God together, you know? I do also check in with the girl who lost her mother. I text her on the anniversary of her mother's passing, but she doesn't respond. I think although we had been close before that, you know, high-fiving, whatever, in the hallway and stuff, I remember when I returned to the States uh, with her to bury her mother, I thought that perhaps going forward I was going to remind her of the pain of that day. And I, I think that's exactly what happened. I think when she sees me, she thinks maybe that I'm like God's defense attorney, you know? I'd rather be with her and put God on trial with her. But um, I'd just say I'm not God's defense attorney because I don't think God needs a defense attorney, you know? <laughs> 
And uh, I think that's what Monsignor wants us to consider. The risk, take that risk of putting God on trial. We'll continue with uh, Born from the Flesh and proceed from pages 8 through 14 of Albacetti's Cry of the Heart in the next reflection. 